the neighborhood on the west side of Manhattan between 34th and 59th Street and 8th Avenue and the Hudson River is known as Clinton. And the average yearly income of his residents is around $95,000. And it's relatively a safe neighborhood to raise a family. It's right next to the theater district and Times Square, where millions of tourists pass through daily to experience New York City at its finest. Parents from all over the world bring their kids to check out the Lego store, take a picture with Spider-Man, or take in a Broadway show. But Times Square wasn't always so family friendly. And Clinton wasn't always some of New York's most sought after real estate. There was a time when Clinton was a working class neighborhood and the criminal element ruled the streets. Back then, Clinton went by a different name. It was known as Hell's Kitchen. Hey, you guys, gals, and bums, and welcome back to A Few Bad Men. All right, today we're going to be taking a deep dive into the Westies, that Irish group of psychopathic killers led by Jimmy Coonan that controlled Hell's Kitchen in the 1970s. But first, I want to say that this channel runs on your support. So if you got eight quarters, 20 dimes, or 200 pennies you can spare, join a YouTube membership and get your button. Or head over to the Patreon channel where you can get exclusive videos and the versions of the videos that I can't show on YouTube. Or if you just want to slide the envelope upstairs to the boss to help the channel run smooth, the PayPal link is in the description. And I want to thank all the people who have recently joined the YouTube membership or the Patreon or just sent the envelope upstairs. You guys keep the channel running smooth, and I can't thank you enough. All right. Also, the merchandise store is open. The Few Bad Men Haberdashery is open, and you can get yourself a nice Shots Rang Out t-shirt or hoodie or coffee mug if you're into coffee. I'm sure you could put some other types of liquids in there if you're into that. So that link is also down below. All right. So now we got all the business out of the way. Let's get into this. In the late 1800s, Hell's Kitchen became the place where the Irish from the Five Points moved to try to make their lives a little bit better. The neighborhood quickly became just as dangerous. Many gangs of young Irish hoods popped up. Gangs like the Hudson Dusters, the Marginals, and the Gophers. In the late 20s, former leader of the Gophers, Oni Madden, was the biggest gangster in Hell's Kitchen. Oni was one of the biggest bootleggers in New York, and he was the owner of the famous Cotton Club in Harlem, as well as dabbling in boxing. He was run out of New York, a mayor, Fiorello LaGuardia, in the early 30s, and he retired to Hot Springs, Arkansas. Around the same time Oni was leaving New York, a future leader of Hell's Kitchen was just making his way into the world. Michael Mickey Spillane was born July 13, 1933. Mickey grew up in Hell's Kitchen, and by 19, he made his debut in the papers. At 8.30 a.m. on November 3, 1952, Mickey and two pals entered the bowling alley at 50th and 7th Avenue and they were not there to roll. One of the men stuck a pistol into the face of Jack Fallon, the manager, and demanded the money from the register. A painter who was working at the bowling alley saw what was going on, and he ran outside and yelled, stick up. Spillane and his accomplices got shook, and they ran out without collecting the 600 bucks in the register. The painter's yells got the attention of patrolman John Quinn. Quinn saw the trio running, and shots rang out. The officer fired seven shots into a crowd, one grazed a woman on vacation from Montreal, and one hit young Mickey Spillane in the back. One accomplice, James McCrane, surrendered, and another one got away. Mickey lay bleeding on the sidewalk in pain until an ambulance came and he was taken to the hospital where they thought he might never walk again. But he was able to make a full recovery. But he had been caught with a loaded pistol and had to do some time. When he got out, Mickey was noticed by the man who ran Hell's Kitchen after Oni Madden, a man named Eddie McGrath. Eddie ran the Hell's Kitchen mob and they controlled the docks and got kickbacks from the workers for allowing them to work. By the mid-50s, the Hell's Kitchen neighborhood was beginning to change. The Holland Tunnel had displaced many of the Irish and a lack of work on the declining docks sent even more away. In the 60s, Mickey Spillane had control over what was left. Mickey had a relationship with the Italian mob who controlled parts of Times Square and Hell's Kitchen. They had a shaky agreement that would allow him to hold on to the small Irish patch that was left and he would not be messed with as long as he didn't try to expand outside the neighborhood. Mickey solidified his all-important political backing when he married the daughter of political leader Eugene McManus in 1960. Mickey Spillane controlled the shylocking and the gambling, operated several illegal casinos, and he had some pull on the union. He was seen as a gentleman gangster, and he was an old-school neighborhood boss. He would help out members of the community when he could, but he also preyed on that same community. 
The Hell's Kitchen Mickey inherited was a shell of the old days, and the money wasn't enough. So Mickey supplemented his income with armed robberies and by kidnapping local businessmen in Hell's Kitchen. He would snatch a guy, take him to a basement, smack him around, have him call his family and get them to bring money for his release. One of these men Spillane snatched up was a man named John Coonan, the owner of a small accounting firm. Spillane had him snatched up and he was taken to a basement and pistol whipped until his wife got together to ransom. John Coonan was released and went home to his family and Mickey Spillane went about his day. To Mickey, this was just another kidnapping, but he was wrong, dead wrong. Mickey had just set off a chain of events that would ultimately lead to his demise. You see, John Coonan had a teenage son who was in the streets too, and he didn't take kindly to some goon slapping around his pop. So James Coonan, known as Jimmy, would make it his mission to get revenge for his old man. James Coonan was born December 24, 1946, to John and Anna Coonan, the second of four children. By his teens, Jimmy was a five foot seven stocky kid who was really good with his hands. His senior year of high school, Jimmy dropped out to pursue his boxing slash street career. He soon became one of the tough guys that other tough guys send to come to collect the money that you owe. Jimmy was good at his new job and quickly gained a reputation as a guy you didn't want to fuck with. He wasn't ready to take on Spillane yet, but that didn't stop him from trying. One night in 1966, Mickey Spillane was headed to his bar on West 46th Street and shots rang out. Jimmy Coonan fired a submachine gun from a roof across the street, forcing Mickey and his pals to duck for cover. Jimmy was making his presence known, but if it came to war, Jimmy would be grossly outgunned. But he was game, so he joined up with Eddie Sullivan and Bobby Huggard. Sullivan was not from Hell's Kitchen and he had beef with Mickey and his twin brother ever since they gave him a beating in the back of Mickey's bar a while back. And Huggard was a lifelong criminal who spent the last few years behind bars along with Jimmy's older brother Jackie. They got together and they decided to take on Mickey Spillane and his crew. Mickey didn't have a big crew, about 12 guys or so, but they were tough. One of Mickey's main killers was a guy named Eddie Comiskey, a guy who studied the butcher's trade in Attica and got the nickname Eddie the Butcher Comiskey. Mickey Spillane made the next move. He hired a local hood named Bobby Lackville out on bail to kill Eddie Sullivan. Eddie and Jimmy found out about this and sent for Bobby to explain the situation. On March 24, 1966, Bobby Lackville's body was found in Long Island City, Queens, with seven bullets in his back. The war was on. Jimmy and Ed Sullivan drove around Hell's Kitchen armed, looking for Mickey Spillane, waiting for him to show his head. But Mickey was in hiding and word was out that Mickey had imported a Texas gunman to do away with the pair. On April 4th, 11 days after the Bobby Lagville murder, Eddie Sullivan was in the Pussycat Club at 324 East 49th Street. Jerry Morales, an ex-con from Texas, was also there having drinks with a guy he met at a Turkish bath named Charles Candlestein. They were out bar hopping and landed in the Pussycat. Coonan and Sullivan walked in and took seats across from Morales and Candlestein. After a conversation, Sullivan and Coonan pulled police badges and ordered the men outside. Outside, they lined them against the wall and frisked them. When the bartender came out demanding payment, he was told to get back inside. Morales and Candlestein were shoved into a car and taken to the Calvary Cemetery in Long Island City, Queens. When they were taken out of the car, Morales began to yell at Eddie Sullivan. You're no cop. You want to shoot me? Shoot me. So Eddie Sullivan granted his wish. Four times, shots rang out. Candlestein tried to run, but he was shot three times and was left for dead. He heard Coonan and Sullivan laughing as they got into the car and took off. A neighbor heard the commotion and called the cops. Lucky for Candlestein, he would survive and give a description of two men that matched two men the cops were already looking for for the Bobby Lackville murder. On April 7th, the cops busted down the door of Eddie Sullivan acquaintance William Murtha and found Sullivan in the living room and Jimmy Coonan hiding in the bathroom. At the station, Eddie Sullivan confessed to shooting Morales after he dared him to. But he said that the gun went off accidentally. Now remember, Morales was shot four times in the groin, the cheek, and twice in the head. Candlestein testified that it was Sullivan and Coonan who snatched him and Morales up and shot him. Eddie Sullivan was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. Jimmy Coonan took a plea and was sentenced to five to ten years. In Sing Sing, he was reunited with his brother Jackie, who was there after shooting a bartender in a robbery going bad. For now, Mickey Spillane, 
could breathe easy. When Jimmy Coonan got out on early release in 1970, Mickey Spillane was away doing six months for contempt of court after he refused to talk in an investigation into police corruption. Jimmy came home to no gain. It was just him. He started his climb back up off slowly. He worked a job for a while, but soon he was back in his criminal ways. He took a play from Mickey's playbook and he snatched a small businessman. But while in the back of Jimmy's car, the victim was able to free himself and jump out of the back door while the car was still moving. He made his way to a cop and Jimmy was arrested. But when Jimmy was brought in front of him, the businessman refused to identify him as the man who snatched him. In 1973, Jimmy was able to scrape up some money and bought a bar at 596 10th Avenue, and he named it the 596 Club. Being a convicted criminal meant that Jimmy had to put it in his brother's name, but it was his and everybody knew it. Jimmy's new bar became the hangout for many of Hell's Kitchen's young gangsters. Young hoods on the make like Muggsy Ritter, Richie Ryan, Patty Dugan, Johnny Hallow, and Billy Bolton. Mickey Spillane and his boys were just a few blocks away at his White House bar. But Eddie Comiskey, Mickey Spillane's most ruthless killer, began to hang out at the 596 Club. Him and Jimmy struck up a friendship and they could be seen sitting in the back in deep conversation. Like I said, Comiskey learned a butcher's trade during his time at Attica. He brought his newfound skills home with him and he applied it to his street dealings. Soon, people began to come up missing in Hell's Kitchen. On September 30th, 1970, Jimmy was in Sonny's Cafe when a scrawny, dirty, blonde neighborhood kid came in upset and he asked to speak to Jimmy. They went to the bathroom and Jimmy said, what's up? The scrawny kid said, I need a gun. Do you have one? Without hesitation, Jimmy reached into the small of his back and produced the 32 automatic and placed it into the hands of the kid. Thanks, Jimmy, said the scrawny kid and he ran back out the club. That scrawny kid was Francis T. Featherstone, known in the neighborhood as Mickey. Jimmy and Mickey were not friends, Jimmy was a few years older, but they knew of each other from the neighborhood, and that's all Jimmy needed to know. A few minutes earlier, Mickey was at the Leprechaun Bar at 9th Avenue and 43rd Street with a couple of friends when a North Carolina native named Linwood Willis decided he wanted to pick a fight with Mickey and his pals. Mickey wasn't afraid to fight, but this guy was over 6 foot and 200 pounds plus, and Mickey was barely 5'9", 140 pounds. He needed something to even the odds. That's what brought him into Sonny's. When he got back to the Leprechaun, he sat with his friends and drank until around 4 a.m. Linwood Willis was still at it. He was yelling obscenities at Mickey and his friends, and then Mickey told his friends to wait here. I'll take care of this guy. Featherstone and Willis went outside. After a few words, shots rang out. Mickey shot Willis in the chest once, put the gun back into his pocket and walked off. A few blocks away, a policeman spotted him at 45th and 10th. The officer got out with his weapon drawn. Mickey dropped the gun and put his hands up. He was arrested and charged with murder. Mickey Featherstone was born September 2nd, 1948. His real name was Francis T. Featherstone, but he didn't know that until he enlisted into the army. He grew up thinking his name was Michael and everyone called him Mickey. He was the last of nine children born to Dorothy Featherstone. The third of her three children were Mickey's father, Charlie Boyle. You see, when Charlie and Dorothy first met, Dorothy's husband had abandoned her with six kids. When they decided to tie the knot, Mr. Featherstone could not be located to sign the divorce papers, so the three Boyle kids got the Featherstone name. Dorothy wasn't the most attentive parent, and the Featherstone kids had the freedom to roam the streets at all times of the night. Mickey became one of those badass little kids in the neighborhood, and after throwing a chair at a teacher, he was sent to a school for troubled youth. Around the same time Jimmy Coonan was going away for the Morales shooting, Mickey was headed to Vietnam. He was assigned to be a mail clerk for the Green Berets. This technically made him a Green Beret, but he never saw any action. After a prank where a drunken medic performed a circumcision on a blacked out Mickey left him scarred. Mickey sunk into a depression and began to drink heavily. And he was disciplined several times by his superiors for his behavior. When Mickey got back to Hell's Kitchen, he just wanted to say to himself. But everywhere he went, he was picked on and he had to kick somebody's ass or shoot them. Or at least that's what he thought. Mickey had only been back for 18 months when he shot Linville Willis. And in that time, he had been arrested several times and shot several people, killing one. He would be taken to an army hospital and an army psychiatrist found Mickey to be off in the head and diagnosed him as paranoid schizophrenic. So he spent most of his time between prison and a mental hospital. In fact, at the time of the Willis shooting, Mickey was an escapee from an upstate hospital. 
Mickey would go on trial for the Willis murder, but would be found not guilty due to insanity. The first time the insanity defense had worked in New York State in several decades. But Mickey was found guilty of assault and sent off to do five years. And he spent that time back and forth between mental hospitals and the prison. Meanwhile, Jimmy Coonan was starting to look like the new power in the neighborhood. Tony Luchas saw this and made Jimmy an offer. Tony Luchas was an old timer compared to Jimmy. He was born in 1919 and at one time was the biggest loan shark in Hell's Kitchen. Luchas still had the mind and the money to be a loan shark, but the streets are for the young. So in 1974, he told Jimmy that if he could come up with half, they could partner up and he would show him the ropes. Jimmy just had to supply the muscle. Jimmy jumped at the opportunity to start making some real money. And that's what they did. Jimmy and Tony put the money out on the streets and reinvested the profits back into the streets. Soon they were some of the biggest loan sharks in Hell's Kitchen. Jimmy would lend money to his boys and they would in turn put it on the streets. Jimmy was making sure that everyone was eating. Jimmy was becoming a boss. Soon he would have to show his loyalty to the neighborhood and the neighborhood would show it back. On a June night in 1975, three black couples were passing through Hell's Kitchen on their way to Harlem and got into an argument with a local kid named Johnny Reed. Johnny walked into the 596 Club, and a few minutes later, the contents of the 596 emptied into the streets led by Jimmy Coonan. One of the Harlemites grabbed the construction sign to defend himself and his friends. Jimmy pulled the gun from his waistband and shot 29-year-old Vanderbilt Evans in the shoulder. Two cops passing through the intersection in an undercover car saw the whole thing and arrested Jimmy. But Jimmy would be able to wiggle his way out of doing time with the help of some of the neighborhood people who were willing to perjure themselves to get one of their own out of a tight spot. Jimmy was lucky. He was just starting to make some real money. He got married to a widow named Edna Fitzgerald and moved to New Jersey, and the war between Coon and Spillane seemed to be in remission. Jimmy still had his eyes on Mickey's spot, but for now, he was biding his time and pooling his resources. A few guys began to defect from Mickey Spillane to Jimmy Coon. One of those guys was Billy Beatty. He was Spillane's bartender at the White House bar, but now held the same position at Jimmy's 596 Club. Eddie Comiskey was also spending more and more time with Jimmy. Eddie was 39 at the time and was taking Jimmy under his wing and schooling him. But he was still technically with Mickey Spillane. Spillane didn't like it, but not too many people told Eddie Comiskey what to do. Jimmy was trying to get Eddie to switch allegiance, but Eddie was loyal. In August of 75, Jimmy got his chance. Dennis Curley and Patty Dugan were best friends since they were kids. One night they were both drunk when Dennis jokingly aimed an unloaded pistol at Patty at a bar. Patty didn't get the joke and became enraged. He jumped over the table, grabbed Curly and began to beat him. You pull a gun on me? Are you crazy? Patty beat Curly until he was pulled off. Later that night on August 25th, 1975, Patty Dugan was laying in wait for his pal in front of his apartment. When Dennis showed up, shots rang out. Patty Dugan put two slugs into his best friend's head at point-blank range and walked off. Word got around that Patty had whacked his best friend. Everyone knew, but talking to the cops was out of the question. But Eddie Comiskey was pissed. Curly was like a kid brother to him, and he wanted Patty Dugan to pay. But Patty was with Jimmy Coonan, and Mickey Spillane didn't want to reignite the war. He had bigger things to worry about. Patty went into a depression. The guilt of killing his best friend was weighing on him. For years, he had been a user, and he fell deeper into his addiction. A few months earlier, Jimmy found out that one of his guys, Charlie Kruger, was using his name and reputation in Queens, but not paying him for the right. Jimmy didn't want to kill Kruger, so he decided to teach him a lesson. He told Patty Dugan and Billy Beatty to snatch Kruger and hold him for ransom. When Charlie Kruger made a call to Jimmy for help, Jimmy agreed to pay the ransom. Dugan and Beatty let Kruger go, Jimmy paid them a few bucks, and Kruger was none the wiser, but now he was back under Jimmy's thumb. Days after the Dennis Curley murder, Jimmy was at home in New Jersey when he received a phone call. It was Patty Dugan. He had snatched Charlie Kruger again, and he was holding him for ransom in Jimmy's own bar. Jimmy was pissed. He refused to give Patty a dime and stop answering the phone. Eventually, Patty let Kruger go, but Jimmy had had enough. He knew that Eddie Comiskey wanted Patty dead, and he used that to lure Eddie the Butcher Comiskey over to his side. A couple of days later, Patty Dugan was called by Billy Beatty. Billy told him to meet him at an address and hung up. Patty didn't know that on the other end of the phone, Jimmy Coonan and Eddie Comiskey had guns on Billy and forced him to make the call. Now, according to Hell's Kitchen legend, later that night, Eddie Comiskey 
and Jimmy Coonan made the rounds to all the neighborhood bars with a macabre trophy. Patty Dugan's head in a garbage bag. At the 596, Billy Beatty was sent to Patty's place and was told to dispose of the contents of a milk container in the refrigerator. When Billy peeked into the container, he saw Patty Dugan's private parts. He took her to the bathroom and dumped the contents into the toilet and flushed. The rest of Patty Dugan will never be seen again. Eddie Comiskey had taught Jimmy Coonan how to make someone do the Houdini. Eddie taught Jimmy how to dismember a body with a saw and butcher knives, how to transport it, and where to dispose of it. His favorite place was a water treatment plant on Ward Island at the end of the East River. He used to work there and noticed that the currents took everything out to the ocean. He became friends with a mobbed up guy named Danny Grillo. Danny Grillo also worked at the plant, but he was a soldier in the Gambino family. It was through Danny Grillo that Jimmy met a man who has a seat of honor at the dinner table in hell, Roy DeMeo. DeMeo was a Gambino associate who, like Jimmy and Comiskey, dismembered his victims to thwart murder investigations. Jimmy has secured his right-hand man and Eddie Comiskey with the Dugan murder. No one would fuck with him now. But Jimmy was still small time and could not see the bigger picture. In 1976, it was announced that the Jacob Javits Center will be built right in the middle of Mickey Spillane's territory. The Italian stood to make millions off of the construction of the center and Mickey Spillane was in the way. Fat Tony Salerno of the Genovese family made his move to weaken who he thought was still the boss of Hell's Kitchen, Mickey Spillane. On the afternoon of August 20th, 1976, Eddie Comiskey was in the Sunbright Bar with Mickey Featherstone, home only a few months from Sing Sing, and Tony Luchich. Outside, a man double parked his car and went into the Sunbright. He walked up behind Eddie Comiskey and shots rang out. Joseph Mad Dog Sullivan, a hired killer from Queens, put one bullet behind Eddie Comiskey's right ear and calmly walked out and got back into his car and drove off. Eddie Comiskey went into a coma that he would not recover from. Joe Sullivan, Eddie Comiskey, and Jackie Coonan all did time together in Attica. The use of Sullivan let everyone know that it was a mob hit. Sullivan was a known killer for Fat Tony Salerno. This made the second one of Mickey Spillane's men to be killed in the last few weeks. Thomas Devaney, another one of Mickey's shooters, was shot behind the air in Dominic's Bar and Grill at 179 Lexington Avenue. Mickey Spillane made himself scarce in Hell's Kitchen. He moved his family to an apartment in Queens and for the most part was retired from the rackets. Jimmy Coonan was now in control of the bookmaking, the unions, the pair, and the Shylock. But he had lost his muscle. That's when he approached Mickey Featherstone. Mickey had never forgotten that Jimmy had given him his gun that night in 1970 and he felt a sense of loyalty. He agreed to be his number two and have his back. Now the neighborhood thought that Eddie Comiskey was crazy, you know, gangster crazy. But they thought that Mickey Featherstone was crazy crazy. No one wanted to mess with Mickey Featherstone. Soon Mickey was going with Jimmy on his pickups and was witness to a few guys Jimmy made do to Houdini. He was usually sauced out of his mind, but that didn't make it any easier for him. He would often head to the john and vomit when Jimmy started his magic trick. Charles Ruby Stein was the king of Shylocks. He took her from a neighborhood thing to big business, and he was the biggest loan shark on the East Coast. He loaned money to legitimate businessmen, politicians, Broadway stars, and gangsters. Ruby was the Shylock the Shylocks went to to borrow money, and it was said that Mickey Spillane was into him for almost a million dollars. Jimmy Coonan met Ruby at the Aeon Club, Ruby's place. Ruby took a liking to the young tough Coonan and took him under his wing. Ruby was connected big time with Fat Tony Salerno and was pretty much untouchable. Jimmy became his driver and bodyguard. This was finishing school for Jimmy. Ruby taught Jimmy the finer points of Shylock and Jimmy would need the knowledge because he had big plans. He wasn't happy with being the boss of Hell's Kitchen. He wanted to get into the big leagues and he had plans of getting connected with the Italians, but he needed to make them notice him. By May of 1977, Jimmy was into Ruby Stein for 90 grand and he decided to clear his debt. On May 5th, 1977, Jimmy was in the 596 Club with Tommy Hess, Richie Ryan, Danny Grillo, and Billy Beatty. He left around 10.30 and came back an hour later with Ruby Stein. He told Ruby to have a seat. Just then, Danny Grillo came out of the kitchen and shots rang out. Ruby Stein was shot in the face and the head and tumbled to the ground dead. The men stood around the dead Shylock and one by one fired a bullet into his face. Then Jimmy took the body to the bathroom and got to work with the numerous butcher knives he had purchased earlier. Ruby's body was taken to Ward Island in separate bags and dumped. Jimmy had cleared his debt. And even better for him, he had Ruby Stein's black book. 
Now, all those people who owed Ruby Stein now owed him. Ten weeks later, on July 17th, the torso of Ruby Stein washed up in Jamaica Bay. The body was identified by X-ray. The torso was X-rayed and compared with X-rays Ruby had taken back in 75 during the checkup. Jimmy Coonan found out the same way that Pittsburgh Phil, a murder incorporated, found out 40 years prior. If you dump a body in the water, you need to puncture the lung or else the bummer float on you. One week after Ruby Stein disappeared, someone rang Mickey Spillane's doorbell in Queens. Who is it? Mickey said over the intercom. I'll be right down. Whoever rang the bell returned to his car and waited for Mickey to come down. When Mickey came down, he approached the car. And as he bent over to look in, shots rang out. Mickey Spillane was hit with five shots from an automatic weapon and died on the spot. The shooters hit the gas and peeled off into the night. Later on, Jimmy was with his new pal Roy DeMeo and he asked him, did he know anything about Spillane? Roy just smiled and said, let's just call it a gift from a friend, Jimmy. Roy DeMeo's boss, Paul Castellano, wanted to plant the Gambino flag in Hell's Kitchen and this was his way of getting Jimmy on his side. Jimmy had finally achieved his goals of taking over Hell's Kitchen and avenging the man who pistol whipped his old man. A few weeks later, Jimmy got word that Paul Castellano wanted to have a sit down with him and Mickey Featherstone. This was big. It could be a good thing or it could be a bad thing. Jimmy wasn't sure. He still didn't know who killed Thomas Devaney or Eddie Comiskey. And he didn't know who knew he killed Ruby Stein. But he was called for and he had to go. But if he had to go, he would make sure that if him and Mickey didn't come out of that meeting alive, no one would. So that's where I'm going to stop for now. Make sure that you stay tuned for part two of the Westies. In order to make sure that you get the notifications, you got to ring that bell and set it for all notifications. That way you don't miss nothing. All right. If you're new here and you like what we do, you want to join. First thing you got to do is you got to bump off that subscribe button. All right. Next thing you got to do is you got to break that thumb. Okay. That way we know you're serious. We already discussed the ways you can slide the envelope upstairs to the boss earlier in the video, so we're not gonna cover that again. All right? So, this has been A Few Bad Men. Keep your nose clean and don't take any wooden nickels. I see you in the funnies.